Close, uh, closer good morning than I was expecting. Um, and hello to the people online. Um, I didn't have a story for today, um, but that's all right. I'll just t- keep it simple with, uh, with my favorite verse. It's Romans 8, verse 15. So you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba Father, for his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, that we can call you Father and that you know us so intimately and you yeah, you think about us and you want us. And I pray, Father, that <clears throat> we would not forget that and that we would live in such a way other people would realize that you love them too. Amen. Our next hymn this morning is Blessed Assurance, so I invite you to stand with us as we sing, and to those of you at home, if you have the words, uh, they will be up on the screen so you'll be able to sing along in your homes. Thank you. Thank you. 
through the fiercest trial. 
This morning, Darren Redekop has come to join us and is going to speak to us. I have the opportunity to pray for him as he um, prepares to speak. Father, we thank you so much for this congregation, both those that are here in the building and that those that are watching online. We thank you that we can be together in spirit, maybe not physically, but we can be together in spirit. Bless Darren as he speaks to us. Give him your words to say. Amen. Amen. Good to see all of you again. How long has it been now? I think uh, seven months, something like that, since uh, we last were physically together. So if you don't know me, I used to be uh, the church planning pastor of the church downstairs uh, that you guys planted uh, through us, uh, Awaken Church. And, uh, and we didn't know as we held our last service at the end of last year that all of this was coming. Uh, and now here we are together again. Uh, it's pretty special. It's really good to see all of you and i um, looking forward to chatting with you afterwards. Uh, Renee and uh, the rest of my boys, Abishai, Asher and Gilead, uh, send their greetings. But Micaiah is here with me. And uh, so he is, uh, he was I, excited, uh, honestly, to, to come and, and be together uh, with all of you this morning. So thanks for having us. You're going to have me for uh, today and next Sunday. Uh, I hope that's okay. If you look in your bulletins, you're going to see that uh, the sermon title this morning is The Alpha and the Omega Part 1. And so, uh, you know, that title uh, may give you the impression that there's a part two coming, and, and that would be the correct impression. I have a little bit of a, of a confession to make about that title, though. Uh, the Alpha and the Omega. Does anybody know where that uh, expression comes from? Just shout it out. The Book of Revelation, that's right. So in the Book of Revelation, uh, that, that expression shows up three times, and... Uh, what God says in that expression is, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the one who is and who was and who is to come. And uh, that expression is used of, uh, of God, capital G, and then also of, of Jesus, uh, the divine Son of God, uh, as well. And uh, my confession this morning is that I'm not going to be, you know, unwrapping uh, that passage for you in the context of the book of Revelation. I've actually sort of shoehorned uh, these, that passage into these two sermons because there are two uh, doctrines, two teachings about God uh, that lately I've just been really excited about. One of them is just the sheer existence of God. Um, God is the first cause of everything that exists. The Alpha Alpha is the first letter of the Greek alphabet, so God is the Alpha. And then the other is the return of Jesus, his promise that he will come again to judge the living and the dead, the Omega, the beginning and the end. So that's kind of where that title comes from, all right? So today in part one, we begin with the Alpha, the beginning, the one who is and who was. And to begin today, I want to take you back. I want to take you back to the year 156 AD, this moment in history, to the city of Smyrna, a city that was known as the glory of Ionia, the jewel of the Asian regions of the Roman Empire. It is a beautiful city. If you look out from the deck of a ship sailing far into the western gulf of the Great Sea, you can see her as she rises from her well-protected harbor to climb the great hill of Mount Pagus with tier upon tier of well-ordered stone-paved streets. The city's renowned Street of Gold thoroughfare, named for the gold-filled temples that line its lanes, it curves about the slopes of Mount Pagus like a necklace on the statue of a goddess. And upon her head, ringing the summit of the hill, sits the Acropolis, the crown of Smyrna, the circle of magnificent public buildings. It's a scene of light, of activity. And as the 200,000 inhabitants of Smyrna go about their day, 
that scene of light and activity is somewhat broken as well. Because in the midst of that, of all of that uh, light and activity, a throbbing chant is heard of a roaring crowd repeating three words together over and over. Ira tus atheus. Ira tus atheus. Ira tus atheus. Away with the atheists. Away with the atheists. Away with the atheists. And that roar is coming from the direction of the arena, which is capable of holding some 20,000 souls, where at this moment, the venerable figure of an 87-year-old Christian named Polycarp stands before the crowd, down in their midst, awaiting his death by burning. And his crime for that punishment? Being an atheist. And yet, how can that be? This man is a Christian. Don't these crowds, doesn't this uh, proconsul overseeing this execution understand what that means? Well, absolutely they do. They understand perfectly that Polycarp is a Christian. And they also understand that if Polycarp is a Christian, then by definition, he is also an atheist. Now, to help you understand how that could be, I'm going to read you a letter by an ancient Jewish Christian named Justin, as he wrote about the Greco-Roman gods. We not only deny that they are gods, but assert that they are wicked and impious demons whose actions could never bear comparison with those even of men. Hence, we are called atheists. And we confess that we are atheists, so far as gods of this sort are concerned, but not with respect to the true God, the Father of righteousness. And so Christians were called atheists, those who believe not in the gods, but only in God. I believe in God. I think it's hard for us to understand today what it would have been like for an ancient pagan who revered all the gods who kept a shrine to his ancestors in his home, who regularly made vows to the divine genius of the emperor. How jolting it would have been for him to hear the first four words of our most ancient Christian creed. I believe in God. What do you mean, you believe in God, he would have said. Which God? Zeus? What about the others? What about Hera, or Hermes, or Mars, or Athena? What about your ancestors, your divinized ancestors? They are gods of a sort. Or the genius, the divine spirit of your father? You believe in God. What is the matter with you? And so you see how strange Christian belief would have seemed in its original polytheistic many gods context and why it was that Christians were called atheists because they didn't believe in the gods. They believed in God. And so do I. I believe in God. I believe in God 
the Father Almighty. As the Apostles' Creed so aptly summarizes the biblical teaching, I believe in him. I believe in him. You know what? There's something life-giving about just saying those words. Now, I wonder, why should that be so? Why should simply saying the words, I believe in God the Father Almighty, make me feel happy? Because as a creature made in God's image, I find the fulfillment of my being in relation to him. Maybe you could try it for yourself, saying it with me in a moment. On the one hand, if you do actually believe in him, but you know what, even if you don't believe in him, as a kind of experiment, if you're watching at home, as a kind of experiment, just trying it on, you know, as it were, uh, to see what it might be like if you did believe in God. So if you like, let's, let's actually say it together, okay? Let's say, I believe in God together. Ready? I believe in God. Let's say it again. I believe in God. All right, now let, let's expand it. Let's expand it to, I believe in God the Father Almighty. Let's try that. I believe in God the Father Almighty. Let's do it one more time. I believe in God the Father Almighty. Doesn't that feel good? Even if you don't believe in God, doesn't that just give you a glimpse of what it might be like if you did? You know what, I'll tell you what it's like. When you believe in God, it's strange. On the one hand, everything's the same, and yet everything is different. What do I mean? I mean that when you believe in God, your life is still your life, your job is still your job, for good or for ill. Tim Hortons down the street is still Tim Hortons down the street. And yet at the very same time, all of those things are different. Because if there is God, that changes everything from a bundle of nothings to a realm, a kingdom exploding with purpose, goodness and evil, virtue and sin, each little thing given its significance by its relation to the transcendent ground of all that exists. And each of us, each moment, moving either toward God or away from God. And so you can see how believing in God changes everything. And yet, why should I believe in God? I mean, isn't that kind of like uh, believing in an overweight, red-suited holiday figure? Except for grown-ups? Isn't that sort of the same thing? You know what, I still remember when I found out uh, certain facts about, uh, about that figure. And let me tell you, the trauma of that experience made me examine my reasons for believing in God very closely. And you know what I found? I found that actually believing in God is nothing like believing in that figure. Why? Well, to begin with, there are serious arguments for the existence of God. Did you know that? Well, there are. There are arguments for the existence of God that I find fascinating and fulfilling at the same time. They have names, some of them. Names like the moral argument. Names like the teleological argument. The cosmological argument. Maybe my favorite, the contingency 
argument, which reasons this way, the contingency argument. It reasons that everything that exists must have an explanation for its existence, either in itself or in something outside of itself. And so when you look at the universe and you ask the question, what is the explanation for the existence of this thing? The answer you end up with is that, well, it had to be something outside of this thing. And what could that be? What could cause, explain, the universe? Or the multiverse, if you happen to be a physics nerd. Well, let's think about it. Since the universe is what? The universe is space and time and energy and matter. Well, the explanation, the causal explanation of the universe would have to be beyond or transcend space. It would have to transcend time. It would have to transcend matter. And what could that be? It turns out the only answer available is a personal God, a being of limitless power that created all of this by an act of will. How does Paul put it in the pages of our Bible? Romans chapter 1, verse 20. Listen to this. Since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, and divine nature have been clearly perceived, being understood from what has been made. That sounds an awful lot like the contingency argument. Or to quote the great British theoretical physicist, Sir John Polkinghorne, who speaks in rather more academic terms, there is more intellectual, I, I could do a British accent, but I won't. There is more intellectual satisfaction in attributing the existence of the universe to the will of a self-sufficient agent. That's how he says God created everything. There's more intellectual satisfaction in attributing the existence of the universe to the will of a self-sufficient agent. I believe in God, the Almighty, the Omnipotent, the First Cause, the Alpha. I believe in God. But not just in God Almighty. I believe in God the Father Almighty. Now let me ask you a question, and, and I'd like an out loud answer. What is presumed by that word Father? Like what else must there be if there is a Father? Children, a child, at least one. After all, you cannot be a father without there being someone whom you are the father of, right? But then in the case of God, who is that someone? If God is father, who is God father of? God the Son. God the Father is father in his relationship to God the Son. Okay, but let's hold on a second here. Let's put ourselves back into the headspace of one of those ancient Romans, those pagans, shouting, Aira tus atheus, Aira tus atheus, away with the atheists, away with the atheists. These Christians, these dirty monotheists who believe in only one God. Or do they? I mean, listen to them. First they say there's only one God, but, but then they call him God the Father. And then add God the Son. And it gets worse than that, because there's also, wouldn't you know it, God the Spirit. Number three, isn't this still polytheism? The belief in more than one God? And not only that, isn't it a blatant contradiction? I mean, one thing can't be the same as three things. One thing can't be three things, which is just what these Christians are saying, that the one God is 
three gods. That isn't reason. That's just pure nonsense. So what would a Christian say to that pagan, to the charge that he's fallen back not only into polytheism but blatant contradiction and nonsense? How would he answer? I think he'd answer something like this. Most excellent Theophilus, because that's how you talk to a Roman, right? When you're a Christian and you're trying to be persuasive and respectful at the same time. Isn't that what Luke says in his gospel? Rest assured, most excellent Theophilus, I am still a dirty monotheist, for I do not believe in one God who is three gods, but one God who is three persons. Do you see the difference? For the way that God is one is different from the way that God is three. If I were saying that the way God is one is the same as the way that he is three, well, that would be a contradiction. But that is not what we Christians are saying. For God is one in a way that is different from the way that God is three. God is one in essence. God is one in essence, but in persons, God is three. That's confusing for us humans because as human beings, we are all one in essence and one in person. But God is one in essence and three in persons. This may be a mystery, but it is not a logical contradiction. Well, you lost me, somebody might say. Sounds like a whole lot of philosophical mumbo jumbo. And besides, when I look in the Bible, I can't even find that Trinity word that you're going on about. And if it isn't in the Bible, then it isn't for me, which is always a commendable sentiment, I think. And it's true, the word Trinity isn't in the Bible. What is in the Bible is the reality described by the word. Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, here's what Jesus said. He said, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them, now listen carefully, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Now, did you catch that? Jesus didn't tell us to baptize people in the names, plural, of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, but in the name, singular, of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, three persons. And when you think about it, this is a good thing. This is a good thing. This makes sense of other things in the Bible. For example, that God is love. 1 John 4, 8 and 4, 16, it says, God is love. Listen to what C.S. Lewis has to say about this statement in relation to the Trinity. All sorts of people, I could do a British accent again because he was a Brit, but I'm not going to. All sorts of people are fond of repeating the Christian statement that God is love. But they seem not to notice that the words God is love have no real meaning unless God contains at least two persons. Love is something that one person has for another person. If God was a single person, then before the world was made, he was not love. With that in mind, listen to this prayer of Jesus. And now, Father, Glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. Now, the glory that Jesus is referring to here is the eternal act of love shared between the persons of God 
before anything began. Because God didn't need to create something in order to love. As one God in three persons, God just is love. He's an eternal party, actually. God is love. Now get ready, because I think this next part is awesome. Because what God the Son does, God the Son, what God the Son does is he lifts us into that love, into the party. Or to put it more completely, more theologically completely, God the Father sends God the Son, who comes down and becomes incarnated in a human body. Doesn't just dress up like a human, He is born as a human, becomes incarnated in a human body, lives a human life, dies a human death as our representative, as the representative of anyone who will ever put their trust in him. And then he rises from the dead and he ascends back to the Father, carrying our humanity with him. And then he sends God the Spirit to draw us toward him. And all of that begins with the Father sending him. I believe in God, the Father Almighty. You know, when you really come to know God as Father, you suddenly realize that Oh my gosh, no matter what else is going on in my life, it's really okay. It really is. I've gone through some weird things in my life. One of them being having a stroke five years ago. And boy, did I discover, no matter what else is going on in my life, it's really okay. Because there is someone at the root of reality who really knows me, who knows who I am, who knows who I could be, Someone who has a name for each of us, who has a name for you, knows who you could be, what he wants for you, an identity for you, that you will grow into, an identity that will grow more and more solid the more that you draw near to him. And so when Jesus taught us to pray, the first words he gave us were, Our Father. Our Father, not our King, right? Not our Emperor, though God is our supreme authority. And also not our friend, not our buddy, though he does invite us into the most personal fellowship. But our Father, not just authority, the King, and not just intimacy, the friend, but authority and intimacy together. Our Father. God, our Father. Now, before we close, and uh, I think it is that uh, Steve's going to come up and, and pray, lead us in prayer to God, our Father. Listen to the words of the great Christian philosopher William Lane Craig as he speaks about the result of his own search for truth as he observed the lives of Christians around him. Here's what he said. I had never met people like this. Think of the pagans as they encountered people like Polycarp in ancient Rome. I had never met people like this. Whatever they said about Jesus, what was undeniable was that they were living a life on a plane of reality that I didn't even dream existed and it imparted a deep meaning and joy to their lives. Everything was the same on the one hand, and yet everything was different. And I craved this. To make a long story short, my spiritual search went on for the next six months. I attended Christian meetings. I read Christian books. I sought God in prayer. Finally, one night, I just came to the end of my rope and cried out to God. I cried out all the anger and bitterness that had built up inside me. Maybe some of you need to do that. And at the same time, I felt this tremendous infusion of joy, 
like a balloon being blown up and blown up until it was ready to burst. I remember I rushed outdoors. It was a clear Midwestern summer night and you could see the Milky Way stretched from horizon to horizon. As I looked up at the stars, I thought, God, I've come to know God. That moment changed my whole life. I had thought enough about this message during those six months to realize that if it were really the truth, really the truth, then I could do nothing less than spend my entire life spreading this wonderful message among mankind. For many Christians, the main difference they find in coming to know Christ is the love or the joy or the peace it brings. All of those things were thrilling for me too. But if you were to ask me what is the main difference Christ has made in my life without hesitation, I would say meaning. I knew the blackness, the despair of a life lived apart from God. Knowing God suddenly brought eternal significance to my life. Now, The things I do are charged with eternal meaning. Now, life matters. Now, every day I wake up to another day of walking with him. I believe in God, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I don't think I call up ushers now, right? No. Okay. A couple of the times when I first <clears throat> led the prayer, I forgot to call the ushers up, and so I had people staring at me from the back. But that's all right. Um, yeah, let's pray. Yes, thank you, Father, that you uh, you've been there right from the start. And uh, well, for you, there wasn't really a start. You've just been. And uh, so you've watched everything, Father. You've watched all the generations that have ever lived grow up. And you knew them all by name. And you knew their favorite food. And uh, that is comforting. You have big, strong hands. And uh, we lift the people up, Lord, who are sick and who are grieving. Um, there's, yeah, on this earth there is pain. Um, and so we thank you, Father, that the best is yet to come and that we have that hope. And uh, we pray for the missionaries in Bolivia. A number of them are experiencing sickness and fatigue. We pray that you bless them and give them strength to carry on. And there's been a number of car accidents in the last week and uh, lots of people have been injured and killed, and we pray um, that in this sadness that they would be drawn to you um, and that they would realize you can carry them and their pain. Thank you for this church family and uh, how you have called us to, to minister to one another and to point us, uh, point each other towards you. In your name I pray, amen. Good morning. Good to see everybody. Um, It's a joy to see some faces I haven't seen for, I forget all the weeks already, but it's been good to see all of you be here this morning. Thank you, Darren, for joining us again and for an amazing sermon. We look forward to next week. 
And what an appropriate Sunday for us to do communion together. Um, we are going to do it a little differently. We're experimenting this week uh, with something we ordered to try out those little cups that were at the back. Uh, just before we start, has anyone been missed? Does anyone need one yet? I don't think so. No, very good. Good job, ushers. Um, so bef as I'm going to speak here, uh, thank you for your grace and all these new things we're trying. But I did find it a little tricky to peel the very first thin layer off. So you can do that now before we actually do communion in case it takes a few moments. Uh, it took me and my fat hands a little bit of time, so I just want to be sensitive to that. Uh, you'll see the wafer first, and uh, we'll take that together when I guide you. And then there's one more layer to peel, and then the juice is available after that. So feel free to open that first layer. Um, and don't feel bad if it takes some time, because it took me some time. Today we celebrate the fact that Jesus defeated death. We celebrate that through our trust and faith in him, as our victorious Savior, we are adopted as children of God in his kingdom and that eternity with him awaits us. By eating the bread and drinking the cup, we unify ourselves as a church uh, to remember this great victory. Our great hero, Jesus, sacrificed himself for us. As Darren uh, told us, the Father sent him to earth for us. We are not bound by sin anymore. We have freedom through Christ. And this is maybe the first Sunday that all of you are able to now see our new um, plaques there. But let's say this together. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. In 1 Corinthians, we read in verse 27. Whoever therefore eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. Sounds like we have a loving Father. Communion is an opportunity for us to humble ourselves and reflect on our own hearts. An opportunity we have to make peace with each other and reconciles, re reconcile ourselves to God. Let's take a moment right now and do that. First Corinthians 11, the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took the bread and then he, when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The body of Christ broken for you. Let us eat the bread together. We 
We continue in verse 25. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat the bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The blood of Christ spilled for you. Let us drink together. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your kingdom through your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world with your peace and grant us strength and courage to be ambassadors of your love in this world. In Jesus' name, amen. The worship team is going to play a song for us. song that we're going to sing together this morning is Change My Heart, O God. When we were practicing this, we started talking about the first line, Change My Heart, O God, Make It Ever True. Well, what does that mean, make it true? To stay true when you're navigating means to go ahead, to go straight. Stay true. Keep your focus on the one who created you, the Father, together with the Son and the Holy Spirit. So stay true. For the benediction this morning, uh, I'm going to read 
uh, some of the lyrics that we actually sang earlier, and I found just a, such a powerful, powerful poetry and statement in this song. Uh, and I'm going to ask you all to stand while I read this. So ground yourself in this this week. There in the ground his body lay, light of the world by darkness slain, then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again. And as he stands in victory, sin's curse has lost its grip on me, for I am his and he is mine, bought with the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell and no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand. Till he returns or calls me home, here in the power of Christ we stand. Amen. Uh, just a reminder, uh, did anyone happen to catch an email that we sent out late last night that had a funny video, of, mostly of Jacob? Okay, good. <laughs> Jen was worried that she might not have a role as an organist anymore. So check your email uh, for that email. If you're not on our email list, the bulletin has an, an email address that will be sent to Andrea, and she can put you on that email list and send you that video. It's a little bit of a tutorial of uh, kind of how to return to church and the etiquette of coming in and how we do our visiting and you know, donations and keep our space, all those sorts of things. Um, so thank you for your grace as we continue figuring all that out. Um, so as we are dismissed today, uh, I'm going to kind of leave it to the people at the back to kind of begin exiting as Jin, or sorry, Lil plays the postlude. <laughs> Um, so we'll start from the back and then just kind of slowly, we'll, we'll kind of stagger our way out. And you can follow the, a, the red arrows that lead you out of the building and we're going to try to keep our visiting outside and it looks a little cloudy so if you don't have sunscreen that should be okay. So go in peace everybody. <laughs>